Tonight we celebrate Black History Month with this special ABC Tri-Cities presentation. During the next half hour, we are sharing stories of determination, success, and tradition from across the Tri-Cities region. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kenny Hawkins. Music and faith are important parts of Teresa Bowers' Parker story. Born in Elizabeth and during segregation, Parker's voice propelled her to a career on Broadway. ABC Tri-Cities' John Jinko shares her journey to the Big Apple and reveals what she's doing now. Teresa Bowers Parker found her voice was a gift at a young age in church. They would let me do a solo here and there, and I was maybe sixish. Parker's journey to Broadway starts in 1951, born in Elizabethton and growing up under segregation. I remember um, colored bathrooms. I remember colored drinking fountains and the bus station waiting rooms. That ended in 1965 with the signing of the Civil Rights Act. Parker was among the first group of black students at Elizabethton in high school. There were still reminders of the Jim Crow era in the early days of desegregation. Students walked out of school one day because when we got there, there was graffiti and the N-word on the building and, and we walked out and there were a couple teachers who themselves were having a little problem with our being there. But her high school band director saw her talent for singing, getting her a vocal teacher. If I'm honest, I never thought of a singing career as I was growing up. Further encouragement from her undergraduate instructors at ETSU led her to the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. It was there in 1979 when she got her big break. I get a call one morning. My name is so-and-so, can't remember it, but your audition is and I auditioned for Ain't Miss Behavior. Broadway came calling, flying Parker to New York City, where she got a role in Ain't Miss Behavior. It came at a time when there wasn't much opportunity for black people on Broadway. It was hard to try to get work. If you weren't an Ain't, and um, there were a couple more that shows that came along uh, that were black, black cast. After Ain't Misbehavin', she gave up her Broadway career to become a minister. That continues today, giving a guest sermon on the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday weekend at St. Thomas Episcopal Church, built by slaves in the 1860s. This building itself, yes, is of significance because it is a reminder, and as a reminder, may it ever propel us forward. Parker's singing career continued with stints in choirs and smaller theater productions, but she also sang with family. A tradition that continues with husband Dan, sister Loretta, and nephew Jovan. It's kind of like, oh my gosh, I'm singing with somebody on Broadway who's had all these musical lessons. She returned to Elizabethton in 2019, reconnecting with her old hometown. It's not just my quote unquote immediate family, the church family, community family. A blessing to me. It was John Jinko reporting. Parker continues to give guest sermons at churches around Elizabethan, hoping to encourage and support others in her community. The story of another musical talent from our region remains largely untold, but a local archivist is working to change that. I don't know what it was like for her, uh, and that's what I'd love to find out. After the break, we are sharing the success story of Mildred Ellis and the project to research her past. We're celebrating black history in a special presentation tonight on ABC Tri-Cities. We're celebrating black history tonight with this ABC Tri-Cities special presentation, honoring black history, sharing our stories. A local archivist is hard at work to share the story of Mildred Ellis. Ellis grew up nearly a century ago in Johnson City. She overcame big obstacles to excel at music, but little is known about her. The director of archives of Appalachia wants to change that. Archivist Jeremy Smith thinks the world should know Mildred Ellis. Born in 1906, Langston High School's 1924 valedictorian made the world her stage. She went from here to being a world traveling bilingual um, uh, composer and pianist with three degrees, a college educator. It didn't come easy for the youngest of four children growing up on East Myrtle Avenue. The resilience just continually shines through. She was born in 1906. Her father died in 1909. Her mother died in 1925. Smith found Ellis's personal papers at Tulane University and is digging into her life. 
and what shaped her growing up in a rapidly changing Johnson City. There's all this growth and opportunity at least for white people. You know, I don't know what it was like for her, uh, and that's what I'd love to find out. Ellis laid a lifelong faith foundation at Bethesda Presbyterian in Johnson City. By the mid-1920s, she was earning honors degrees in music and French at Nashville's Fisk University. We know at Langston they had music classes, they had music teachers. Inevitably, through Bethesda, she was involved in the music there. There's just not a lot of documentation I've found. By 1947, she was an accomplished and well-known college professor, composer, and musicologist. That's when she brought her first back home, a major one-night Negro music festival at then East Tennessee State College. She programmed it, she produced it, she rehearsed everyone. Uh, she selected the material, she included some of her original compositions, and it was uh, performed and programmed and really well received. Ellis visited her home often and was buried here when she died in 2004. But she made her mark helping celebrate and preserve black and African culture as a strong, independent black woman. She made space for herself. She achieved her goals and she really paved a path that I think a lot of others have been able to follow now. Archives of Appalachia director Jeremy Smith hopes to produce a scholarly article, article on Ellis' life by the end of the year. An area school librarian's research will soon make its way into the fifth grade curriculum in Johnson City Schools. Students will learn about what it was like attending Johnson City's segregated high school. The motto was enter to learn, enter to learn, depart to serve, and also a legacy of high expectations. We share stories from Langston High after the break as we celebrate Black History on ABC Tri-Cities. We're celebrating Black History tonight on ABC Tri-Cities. I'm Kitty Hawkins. Students who attended Johnson City's segregated high school Langston are at least in their 70s now. A school librarian studied the school's history and recorded some of the students' reflections in video interviews. Anna Armstrong's work will be incorporated into official fifth grade curriculum throughout Johnson City. It tells a story of a proud, tight-knit school that accepted, or should I say expected students to reach for their dreams even in a time of segregation. Mountain View Elementary Librarian Anna Armstrong is passionate about the history of Johnson City's segregated high school. She put that passion, first sparked by the late black historian and Langston alum Mary Alexander to work, recently interviewing a handful of former students. I said, how do you want Langston to be remembered? And almost every one of them replied and said, I want them to remember that this was a place of excellence, a place of learning. I want them to know how much our teachers loved us, what a community and family we had within this building. Moving from one family to another, you know, that's what we did. We moved from home from that family and then went to school and they, they took, took care of us and nurtured us. They were Mountain View fifth graders. Armstrong created a one-day lesson based on civil rights curriculum. She got uh, captured what we would want to say, and she had already she was already part of it before she spoke to us. So I, that's that's beautiful. Armstrong said students reacted very positively, and few knew anything about the school that closed with integration in 1965. Almost sense of um, awe when you talk about the Golden Tigers athletics, the band program, and telling them some of the memories about how Johnson City used to show out to support this school. 1962 grad Evelyn Debro said students today need to know the stories, the good and not so good about a time she says shouldn't be forgotten. We lost a lot of our heritage though. That's the part that, that bothers me is that Heritage is lost, and now they're trying to take it out of so much, take this, ban so many books, and they don't want to talk. That's stupid, because you're just going to repeat it. That heritage won't get lost in Johnson City. The school system will use Armstrong's curriculum in all of its elementary schools, and its legacy is also playing out in the Langston Center inside the former school. The motto was enter to learn, 
Enter to Learn, Depart to Serve, and also a legacy of high expectations. And that's what um, you were in tune with. To see that Langston legacy continue of Enter to Learn, Depart to Serve, and to have our kids now knowledgeable of that legacy is amazing. You can watch the former Langston student interviews conducted by Armstrong on our YouTube channel. Just search Anna Armstrong Langston. A remembrance march to honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. continues for nearly three decades in one part of our region. Thanks to a group of individuals taking Dr. King's message of uh, perseverance to heart. There were some people who didn't believe in what we were doing, didn't want us to do it. And uh, but we kept pressing on. After the break, the story of one woman who was a part of the first effort back in 1996, and now the march has trans transformed from 27 years later. We're celebrating black history tonight on ABC Tri-Cities. I'm Kenny Hawkins tonight. We're celebrating Black History Month on ABC Tri-Cities. It started as a small march on the UVA Wise campus. A group of about 50 people in the mid-90s remembering the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, honoring his legacy. But 27 years later, it has blossomed, now carrying an even greater meaning for those who started the movement. ABC Tri-Cities Kelly Grossfield shares the story of how one tradition is being passed on to a new generation. It was Mary Eubanks, the director of UVA Wise Residential Life at the time, who started the MLK Junior March on the UVA Wise campus nearly three decades ago. Described as a spirited and loving woman who knew how to take charge, she did just that in a time when it wasn't exactly welcome. And we talked about it, we met about it and everything, but we decided we were going to keep going regardless. And um, it was kind of frightening at first. But uh, I'm glad that we didn't let that stop us. Sandra Jones was part of the inaugural march. She said the mission of Miss Mary Eubanks replays in her head, always recalling the first time their feet took to the pavement on Dr. King's birthday, noting the changes throughout the years. We walked on the sidewalk. People didn't come out. Now people are outside waiting on us to come. You know, people are just enjoying, they're coming from everywhere to be a part of it. And that blesses me to see the unity. Corey Sanchez remembers his first time marching near the Wise County campus, freshly turned 20 years old. Now bestowed the honor of emceeing the ceremony. You can feel the energy in the place uh, when we're talking about the message of Dr. King. And it's not just a one day event, it's something we should celebrate. Uh, 365 days a year. With candles in hand, the unique nighttime march feels magical. But to Sanchez, the most magical part is the meaning and the message left behind by Dr. King for generations to come. No matter what your nationality, whatever your race is, we build it together and to make it better for everybody. And it takes time. And the struggle is part of the success of the of the mission that sometimes we kind of look back and we're like, how do we get here? We don't talk about the journey. After 27 years of marching, Sandra Jones says all she wants is to see the tradition continue for another 27 years and more. I pray that there's someone there at the college that will continue to uh, pass the torch and keep going because I don't think this should ever be forgotten because there are so many young people that are coming up behind us that need to know the story. And with the activism of a new generation, Sanchez says he believes the tradition will not only continue, but also continue to grow. I think the way the community has kind of embraced it and over years, you know, people change, times change. And what the town has done and what the college has done is come together. This is one of the events that we can come together and not only celebrate Dr. King, but celebrate our partnership. That was Kelly Grossfield reporting. Miss Mary Eubanks remains a part of the UVA Wise family. Officials with the university tell us she now works on the Charlottesville campus, continuing to help students in spreading Dr. King's message. Black students at local universities are also working to carry on Dr. King's legacy and improve inclusion on campuses. Angel Johnson is a junior at UVA Wise. She formed the Black Student Union in the spring of 2022. She told us it was a big undertaking, but one she was ready to tackle head on. 
it's been very hectic, but it's been very rewarding too. Um, we've gotten a lot of things accomplished, including having a fundraiser, um, just gathering members. There's so many people who are interested in joining. And um, it's not that I was surprised by that. I think I was just surprised by the amount of people. Johnson told us it wasn't easy to get the UVA Wise Black Student Union to where it is today. For every person who didn't like it, there was 10 more people who supported me. So I focus on the positives more than the negatives. While it's in its first year at UVA Wise, the Black Affairs Association at East Tennessee State University has been around a few years. It changed along the way, welcoming everyone, not just students of color. I know it's been kind of fun to revamp Black Affairs and get a new executive board and help everybody learn how learn what Black Affairs is and kind of get away from that stigma that we're only for black students. President Deron Dean says being inclusive is a top priority. Both black student union leaders say they want to create a place where people can grow, have good conversation and celebrate all cultures on campus. Sometimes it is children who provide the inspiration for others to act. One nine year old has big dreams and somewhat simple plan to get things done. If you like practice, you can do anything. After the break, you'll hear what he's already accomplished and we'll share the story of what he's working on now, celebrating black history on ABC Tri-Cities. While some nine-year-olds spend their spare time gaming, playing sports or other hobbies, Kadeen Hearn of Harlem is a master of words. He was the poet at the inauguration for a New Year's governor. While his story is just starting, Greg Mocker found out he's sure to inspire generations to come. Congratulations. Thank Keep you. up the good work. Okay. I will. When you go for a walk with Caden Hearn. So you're very popular now, Caden. Yes. Be prepared to stop and listen. Congratulations. Very good for you. If you like practice, you can do anything. People around West 133rd Street. What well, looking like that today? I'm in the interview. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> are asking him about his words at the inauguration of the governor of New York. In my mind, I used to be a child of poverty, not knowing that hopes and dreams can become reality. In my mind, I thought it was fine to sit in the back of the classroom because my teacher never asked me to read or write. But little did she know, I was ever so bright. The nine-year-old is the In poet laureate for New York. He was waiting to go inside the Apollo last year when Governor Kathy Hochul stopped by for one of her official appearances. And there's a long line around the block. And I saw this young man stand there. I said, you going in to watch somebody? He goes, no, I'm a poet. I'm going to go recite. But now I understand why being called ashy and black. Black, black is, is the, the color, color of my skin, so soft, beautiful, silky, and smooth. In my mind, I was thinking about things in my mind and how, like, um, how things are not fair. His grandma provided the initial inspiration. Questions he asked sometimes, go to Google, please. I can't answer it all, you know? Yeah, he's always been, it's a little boy. She told me to write down my notes of what I was thinking. He's working on another poem and paying attention. Don't get the big head, because you are, you are a star. I will. Thank to his family and friends on the block. Because if you give up, the world's never going to change and it's going to stay the same. Good cool personality, okay? Thank you. Okay. But now I understand why. In my mind, I heard my ancestor cry. They, they helped help clear the, the path, path so others, others do not have to die. Justice and peace. Oh, Father, please help me. And that's what I heard in my mind. In my mind, that's an incredible nine-year-old. Thanks for joining us for our special presentation, honoring black history, sharing our stories. I'm Kenny Hawkins. We hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.